we go. Okay, so my name is Holly Johnson. I'm the Program and Outreach Coordinator for the Granby Public Libraries, and I want to welcome you all to Food Farms and Forward Thinking, which was actually the brainchild of Ann Wilhelm, who I think is joining us tonight in this Zoom meeting. So I want to thank Ann very much for um, for helping put this all together um, because she was very instrumental in seeing that we have this excellent panel with us tonight. So um, let's see. I guess I guess we can talk a little bit about. Um, the actual program. We had so many topics we wanted to cover and um, we knew that we wanted to talk about our food system because we knew that there were a lot of problems with the delivery and there were a lot of consequences for how we're producing our food. Um, we knew it was gonna impact individual health. We knew it impacts our communities. Um, so we were concerned about that. We wanted to make sure we touched on that. We also knew that there were people that were um, very interested in hearing more about land management as it pertains to farm protection, farmland protection and preservation. Um, there's, um, there, you know, there's got to be a plan for social, economic, and environmental enrichment of the community. And um, Granby's already um, a town that is is focused on those things, but. Um, we just felt that there was there was more information out there and people needed to hear more about that. So we were able to put together um, this excellent group of panelists. And um, first off, we have Chelsea Gazillo from the Working Lands Alliance. She's a director with Working Lands Alliance. Um, also joining, and Kelsey, you, did you wave to the group when I said your name? There you go, she's gonna wave. Um, we have Chelsea Gazillo, who's going to be with us this evening. Also, we have Kip Kolsinskis, a Connecticut conservation consultant, and he's a Working Lands Alliance co-chair. Um, joining us as well is John Guskowski, Connecticut Resource Conservation and Development President and uh, the senior planner, a senior planner with CME Engineering. And then last but not least, Latha Swamy, and she's with the city of New Haven. Um, she's a food policy director and a food policy and planetary health consultant, and also a Working Lands Alliance member. So um, there's a lot of really knowledgeable people on this panel, and they're going to share a lot of information tonight. Um, we're going to encourage folks, I'm gonna segue here into the administrative details. We're gonna encourage folks to use the chat feature if they have questions during the program, um, just because there's, there's enough people that if, um, it's just a better, it's probably the best way to do it. And we'll try to monitor those questions and get answers to you as we're going along. Or if you can hold your questions to the end, that'll be great because I think at that time, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask, as long as we don't have a free for all develop, uh, you know, it hasn't happened yet. So I, I think we'll be fine, but you'll be welcome to have more dialogue discussion and ask questions as we get to the end of the program. Um, let's see, I also want to mention, I have to put in a plug here, that uh, this, this uh, particular program is part of our Granby Grows program series, and uh, that's being sponsored by the Granby Public Library, the Granby Ag Commission, and uh, the Granby Land Trust. And so my goal with this program series was to bring the experts to the Granby community so that we could see more, learn more, hear more. I know we'd rather be doing these things in person, but given the current state of affairs, um, Zoom is the best we have to offer right now. Um, for those of you who are just signing in, um, we are going to be recording, or we are recording this program. So it should become available in the near future on the, the library's YouTube channel, Facebook page, and then I'm sure our Working Lands Alliance um, folks will be able to tell us more about where we can access that. So, um, but just quickly back to that Granby Grows program. Um, we're hosting programs every month. Um, some of them are lighter in nature, some of them are more serious. We have local farmers and we have garden professionals and land managers and we're covering environmental topics farm topics, all kinds of stuff. So um, I would encourage you to keep your eye on the Granby Public Library website, B 
because um, those new programs are posted there all the time. And if you want to get monthly updates, we can certainly put you on our e-newsletter uh, distribution list. So I think, I feel like I've covered all the important stuff. If I haven't, I'm sure someone's going to let me know. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Well, I did give you a quick introduction earlier. And please, panelists, feel free when you go live and feel you have to share something or you are sharing something, um, please feel free to reintroduce yourself and give a little more background so that uh, people have a little more information on that. Um, I'm not going anywhere, folks. I'll be with you the whole time, but you are going to not see my face any longer because I think you need to focus on the rest of the people that are, that are here to share all their wonderful information. So um, take it away. All right. Give us one second here. Do you see the screen, Chelsea? I do, yeah, sorry. I'm just having some technical difficulties on my end. Give me one okay. second. No worries. Hold on one second, everyone. There we go. All right. Can everyone hear me? Great. Yes. So before we start, I want to thank Holly, Ann, and the Grandview Public Library for hosting us this evening. We are very excited to be here with you to present American Farmland Trust Farms Under Threat Findings. How they are and how they are relevant to the town of Granby. We will present, be presenting on our soon to be released updated versions of both Connecticut Planning for Agriculture, a guide for Connecticut municipalities, and conservation options for Connecticut farmland, a guide for landowners, land trusts, and municipalities. Uh, Holly already took a minute to introduce us this evening. However, I will reintroduce myself. My name is Chelsea Gazillo, and as Holly mentioned, I'm the Working Lands Alliance Director, and we are a project of American Farmland Trust. I am accompanied by my colleagues, Kip Kolzinska, Lotha Swami, and John Guskowski. As a team, we work to update both the Planning for Agriculture and Conservation Options Guides for Connecticut. Um, okay. Can you move to the next slide, please? Lifa, I think I may have actually, we are actually two slides ahead. Sorry, I changed my, what I was gonna say around a little bit. Okay, great, right there is perfect. So for those of you who are not familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a quick introduction. We are a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We believe that saving the land that sustains us means focusing not just on retaining and protecting the agricultural land base, but on the management of that land as well, and on farmers, ranchers, and landowners who work the land. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from direct land protection to soil health and water quality initiatives to training service providers to help a new generation of farmers and ranchers gain access to land. Our programming and research informs our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office in Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. All right, so let's turn now to the findings from our Farms Under Threat Report. Tonight, we're focusing on the State of the State Report for Connecticut. State of the State paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. I just want to clarify that I know in Connecticut we don't really have ranch land, um, but that's what our uh, report focused on nationwide. Next slide, please. We used the multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats of agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy response. We're using this report to raise public awareness, inform state and federal policy, and encourage more direct and permanent ag land protection. Next slide, please. 
Before we dive into the specific findings for Connecticut, I wanted to give you some, nation, some national context. With that being said, let me touch quickly on our national findings. From 2001 to 2016, a period of historical low housing starts, the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's equivalent to all the land planted in the U.S. to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was, a low, was to low-density residential use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country scattered large lot housing has been fragmented and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized just how big of a threat it is. Importantly, more than 4.4 million acres of land converted was what we have identified as nationally significant land land that is best suited for intensive food and crop production. Next slide, please. As you can see from this slide, Connecticut sadly lost, or sadly land, pun intended, seventh in the report's list of the top 12 most threatened states. While the state's ties, while the state ties for six in the report's overall policy scorecard, it is clear that its existing suite of policies is not doing enough to stem farmland conversion. Next slide, please. In addition to the National Farms Under Threat Report, we were lucky to receive funding pr to produce a Regional Farms Under Threat Report that weaves together some of the national, spatial, and policy findings with some specific New England findings. My colleague, Jamie Pottern, and my other colleague, Laura Barley, authored a regional report entitled Farms Under Threat, A New England Perspective. The report dives a little deeper into the New England region as a whole and also draws on a variety of other reports and data sets like the Ag Census and the New England Food Vision and draws on AFC's ongoing work funded by Farm Credit East and CoBank. The report goes beyond the farmland itself and also examines threats and opportunities for New England farm viability and its farmers. It centers on issues of justice, equity, and climate change and provides recommendations for how we might achieve greater regional resilience for the future. We encourage you to download the report and after this presentation, I'm more than happy to put a um, link to the report in the chat. All right, so at this point in time, let's dive into the data available for Connecticut on our interactive website. Please bear with me while we um, switch to the website. So, Lisa, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, okay. All right, can everyone see my screen? All right. Yes, we got gotcha. you. All right, great. All right, so let's start by pointing to this tab over here, the reports and data tab. This is where you'll find the fact sheet that describes methodology. If you're interested in getting access to the geospatial data we use, you will find a form for the request for this geospatial data layer tab. Now let's go to the drawdown menu um, and we're going to choose Connecticut. So this will take you to Connecticut. Here you will you will find both the spatial data and the policy scorecard. I'm not going to go over the policy scorecard with you tonight, but it's over here on the left hand side. So now let's look at the four categories of spatial data we've created, starting with land cover use. All right, so we'll go down here. Uh, farms under threat, the state of the state, used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land in the U.S. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land that we've identified as low-density residential development. It also includes federal land permitted for grazing and a first-ever attempt to spatial identify wood land associated with a ranch or farm. Our mapping shows that there are over 347 acres of agricultural land. And as you can see um, on the left here, 
We have over 113,000 acres of cropland, 63,000 acres of pasture land, and 171,000 acres of woodland. All right, let's move on to the PBR values uh, or productivity, versatility, and resiliency. Here we wanted to analyze the quality of land being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created with the help of National Panel of Experts and Index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the US. This map shows the range of these PVR values across the state. Higher PVR values indicate higher suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and stable grains. All right, so then we are gonna go to the National Significant Agricultural Lands tab. Uh, this map shows the, natural, the nationally significant agricultural land in Connecticut. There are over 180,000 acres that fall into this category, which represents about 52% of the state's ag lands. A little more than half of this is cropland, about, about 97,000 acres. 56,000 acres of woodland and, 20, and over 27,000 acres of pasture. And then lastly, we have the last, or this uh, overlay, which is our conversion of agricultural land. Again, we looked at a 15 year period from 2001 to 2006, uh, a period of historically low housing starts. We mapped the conversion of the agricultural land into two types of land use. The first is a conversion we used to seeing and mapping urban and high density residential commercial and industrial typically around the edges of cities and towns this category also includes rural industrial and energy production sites including oil and gas well pads and solar panel installations uh, the second type is low density residential or ldr ldr areas range from lower density sub subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual housing is being built. The majority of Connecticut's Connecticut conversion over this time, 60%, was to low density residential development. What's important to know about LDR is both that this is modeled and that there may well be places where there's active agriculture on some land that is designated as LDR and some of the small parcels may be highly productive and profitable. But we also know that LDR tends to be transitional land use. Land in Connecticut was considered LDR in 2001, or land in Connecticut that was considered LDR in 2001 was five times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. And we know that continued conversion to LDR creates management challenges for producers who have to adjust to farming in and around non-farm neighborhoods. So the total ag land converted over this 15 year period was 23,000 acres. That represents over 6% of Connecticut's agricultural land base. Land converted consisted of 5,600 acres of crop land, um, 1,900 acres of pasture and 10,500 acres of woodland associated with farms. As mentioned earlier, a half of the land converted was land we considered nationally significant. All right, before we hand it over to Kip, John, and Lafa, I want to give you some perspective on what this means for the town of Granby. So I'm going to scroll in to Granby. So you can look at individual municipalities on this map. And let's see here, there's Granby. All right, so while we've seen conversion throughout Connecticut, we can see that there was a fair amount of conversion in Granby. So if you look, you can see that there is a patchwork of red and green. And uh, the red is where the conversion of agricultural land or UHD or urban and highly developed and LDR land uses are. We can also see that the beginning of the patchwork of the cropland surrounded by high levels of low density low density residential as well as urban and highly developed land. What is especially noteworthy about the conversion in this area is the concentration of nationally significant agricultural land in the region. 
All right, so I'm going to flip to nationally significant agricultural land. So that is all of the nationally significant agricultural land in Grandy. That doesn't include statewide significant or um, locally important, which I'm sure Kip will get into in a minute. Um, all right, so now I want to go back to the slide. So if I'm going to stop sharing my screen and if you could just go to my last slide, that would be great. All right, so next slide. All right, so this last slide shows um, what land is an agricultural easement throughout the country. And as you can see, we do have a lot of um, land that is permanently protected in Connecticut. However, um, we have also lost a lot of land. So there are some more detailed maps that show where these specific farms are. However, um, I think that this is something we could work on further as a state is to uh, better map out where our protected lands are and where we should be targeting um, protecting more land. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kip to give further insights on our Farms Under Threat Report and why releasing the report seemed to align nicely with our plans um, to update the Connecticut Planning for Agriculture and Conservation Options Guide, which these are photos of. Okay, I guess I'm unmuted now. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for that overview, Chelsea. I think that's really helpful because I think that's at the heart is that even though, and Chelsea didn't get into it from a policy standpoint, we have some really good tools, which I'll talk a little bit about, and uh, maybe uh, John will as well. I would say that as far as ranking, um, as far as tools, that we have from a, a policy perspective, I think we're like, uh, you know, six best of a policy scorecard in the country. But again, you know, having lost being on that negative top 10 list of states that have lost the highest percentage of valuable farmland is is not a good thing. We, we could do better and we need to do better. So, and so we really, believe that because of changes in agriculture and um, the urgency of changes to the food system and because of climate change that now is the time to really try to up the amount of land protected and to grow agriculture and diversify agriculture in Connecticut. So we see the planning for agriculture guide and the conservation options as being important tools to help communities and landowners and farmers with uh, moving forward. So again, many of you are, are certainly familiar with what it takes for agriculture to be successful and though there may be other people that are not as familiar um, and that this is the first time in our nation's history that the majority of the population is more than two generations from a farm. So they don't know what they don't know as far as what it takes for agriculture to be successful. So I just thought that I would review a couple of those things. So secure land access, so what that means is having, you know, either to own or to lease land and have a, a for a period of time that you can really build a bu business. We wanna have healthy soils, air and water, biodiversity, that's really important to agriculture for our, life on this planet and agriculture for the past 10,000 years, it's been really important to know what your climate and weather is. And unfortunately, because of climate change, it's, it's quite unpredictable. So even though agriculture really would prefer to have um, a favorable climate and weather and be able to predict that, we're in, this, in unpredictability right now. So uh, agriculture and communities need to figure out ways to mitigate and adapt to climate change and build resiliency. And then of course, agriculture is a business, so it needs to be economically viable. Uh, farmers and farm workers need to have a living wage and they need support services, infrastructure and supplies in a reasonable distance from their agricultural 
businesses. They need supportive education uh, in, and research institutions and programs to help them um, with conservation and stewardship and economic development, and then an adequate labor force. Next slide. So again, I tell uh, farmers and beginning farmers who do a lot of work with beginning farmers that you're more likely to be put out of business by your neighbor or an unsupportive municipality than you are by any state or federal regulator, and that's unfortunate. So partly, as I said, people don't know what they don't know, but we, so we need to, to make sure that we have supportive policy laws, regulations, and taxing structure to help agriculture be successful and to provide all the goods and services we're expecting and, and having informed elected officials and consumers so that people are willing to pay what it really costs for healthy food that's available to everyone. Um, we need affordable land and housing, as you all know. Uh, we have an affordable housing crisis, and so that is really impacting where beginning farmers and uh, farmers are able to farm successfully. And ability to transfer and share knowledge and um, succession of land and businesses between generations. And we have an aging farm population, and we'll talk about that, about that a little bit more later. But so we need to find ways to get that land and businesses between generations, either within families or outside of families even. And then of course, we all are familiar with Yankee Ingenuity has done some, some great things as it relates to agriculture. So having that flexibility to innovate and adapt to climate change and markets is really important. To plan for and manage for risks, uh, whether it's emergencies or just the everyday risk. And then we really want to have a, a, the key, I think, is having diversity. And we do have a lot of diversity to agriculture. And I think we're going to experience more, not only to the kinds of agriculture, but we want diversity to our farmers. And we want diversity of agriculture in all 169 towns and, city, and cities. Next. So, and this is another thing. So it's, I think it's important for those of us that, that are advocates for agriculture and changing the food system and, you know, uh, keeping life on this planet alive to really have the relevant facts and the key messages around what well-managed agricultural land can provide. So typically we think of agricultural products and and uh, the role in the regional food system, which Lathaw is gonna talk a little bit more about, that having agriculture that's well-managed um, is a key towards sustainability. Um, having a diversified local economy, we know is, is more important than ever. Agriculture in Connecticut, most of our farms, really only about 50 to 65% of a typical Connecticut farm is in active production. So the rest of it is wetlands, woodlands, riparian areas. So it's really offering a lot of habitat and biodiversity that we all benefit of from protecting air and water quality. I think this is really not uh, well understood of the role of the pervious farmland as far as recharging groundwater and discharging groundwater. And that's becoming more critical with climate change, flood, st flood storage and protection, scenic beauty, recreation opportunities, protecting our cultural resources. No one's particularly interested in protecting an 1800s farmhouse when it's next to uh, a Cumberland Farms. They'll protect if it's next to a farm or on farmland, but uh, we want to protect our cultural resources. And then climate change mitigation and adaptation. And again, I think this is critical. Uh, farms can are really good in plants and trees in storing carbon in the soil and um, of being able to um, get water into the ground, offering pathways for uh, biodiversity plants and animals to be able to move, to migrate to different areas because of climate change, to be able to reduce the food miles, to uh, be a source of renewable energy. Well, uh, there's just a lot that agricultural land can help us do with mitigation adaptation. Quality of life, I know that that's important to folks in Granby 
and part of what your interest is in agricultural land. And then social and environmental justice of who, who owns farmland, who has access to farmland, who has access to food and healthy food. So I, I think we're, we, we all know that we can do better with that. Next slide. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about climate change um, as a, a driver for why we wanna have agriculture in our communities and in Connecticut. You know, if you think all of your fruits and vegetables are gonna continue to come from the Southwest and from Mexico, you're sadly mistaken. Um, what was it that Phoenix this year had um, well, I think it was 140 something days over 100 degrees. That's the most on record. Over half of the country is in a drought status right now. And again, we're just coming out of a short term drought. So we're going to continue to have extreme weather, floods and droughts, high temperature stress, new pests and diseases. Some of that is from climate change. Some of that is from the, the, the globalization of our economy, of new pests and diseases coming here, and just less predictable weather. And to me, I think that's the hardest thing for farmers to deal with. Next. And though we're fortunate here in the, in the Northeast, we're going to have basically a climate that's suitable for most forms of agriculture and for people. Yes, we've had uh, a short-term drought, drought and we've also had years where we've had a lot of water and though most years we're gonna have adequate water, sometimes too much, sometimes not enough. So we're gonna have to do a better job of managing that. A longer and warmer growing season, there's gonna be shifts in productivity for certain crops. And I think there's opportunities for agriculture here to expand and diversify. Probably the last two years, after again having the hottest July and August on record here, I think we had some of the best melons um, that, that I've ever had in Connecticut. And I think that probably the uh, wines that were made from grapes last year and this year are going to be some of the best red wines that Connecticut has produced. So, and we have a huge opportunity. 24% of the population lives in the Northeast. Within two hours of Connecticut, there's over 30 million people. So we're in the heart of the marketplace. So let's look at growing agriculture as diversifying the economy and growing jobs. And then of course, the importance of protecting the ecosystem services that are even, even more, more critical in uh, a, a changing climate. Next. So Granby is, as you that are Granby residents are aware, is a really special place. You know, there's only a handful of towns, and I worked all over Connecticut, all over the Northeast. This, the, Granby is one of a few towns in Connecticut that has the diversity of soil landscapes and ecosystems and biodiversity. Um, that any, any towns have in Connecticut. That you go all the way from, you know, an elevation of about 150 feet to over a thousand feet. So from the Connecticut Valley, all the way up to the western, western beginning of the Western Highlands, that you have very complex soil patterns all the way from ancient Glacial Lake Hitchcock uh, sediments and uh, sand dunes all the way up to the hard pan acidic tills that we typically think of as Western Connecticut. So you have very complex soils. You also have some really high areas of concentrations of prime farmland soils, of those farmlands of national importance. Those are typically in the um, Eastern part of town and, the, and the, the Southern part of town, but you have some really high concentrations of excellent soils that can grow about anything with a uh, you know, 200 day growing season. You also have really important cold water resources. I'm a trout fisherman, so I really love um, the Salmon Brook and Eastern West branches. I've caught some nice, nice trout in those waters. And those are, that's a really important uh, sub watershed of the Farmington River, which as we know has wild and scenic status. You're close to the markets of Springfield and Hartford and the airport and I-91. I think that's a real, real advantage for farms here. You also have significant high quality aquifers and recharge areas, which again, um, I would encourage you to protect those areas where you have uh, um, 
uh, bedrock controlled uplands and till coming down to sand and gravel deposits and stream corridors. You also are adjacent to some very vibrant and productive agricultural communities in Suffield and uh, Southwick, Mass. And so I would encourage not only the agricultural community, um, but also the elected officials to make contact with those towns and be, to be working with them as that larger agricultural community. Next. Again, you have some beautiful scenic landscapes and cultural resources that are deserving of protection and make Granby special. You have citizens that are engaged with the agricultural community, interested in supporting it. And you have some really successful and diverse agricultural businesses that, that need to be uh, supported in every way possible. And again, you know, I'm uh, getting older all the time. And though um, I would imagine that there are some aging farm and forest landowners in Granby. So we want to make sure that you understand what your options are, that you're thinking about uh, succession planning for who's going to be farming that land or using those, those forests uh, to make a living and produce uh, products. And there's, as, as Chelsea laid out, this ongoing threat of sprawl. Because of where you're geographically located and where Connecticut is geographically located between Boston and New York, there is always gonna be the threat of sprawl. So keeping agriculture viable, having the tools to protect land are critical. Next. So let's look at some of what we have in Connecticut. And we're really fortunate, as I said, we've, um, we've, we've done some good things and certainly Granby's been part of it as far as protecting farmland and forest land. And there's actually money for purchasing of conservation easements for landowners to be compensated if they need it for the, the value of that uh, right to develop um, farmland or forest land. So we had the Department of Agriculture has the Farmland Preservation Program, the Community Farms Program, and then a new program of Buy, Protect, Sell. So that's for uh, purchasing easements. And then the Buy, Protect, Sell is if there's an urgency um, with the landowner that they may not be able to have the time to go through an easement, a regular easement program of the state or land trust being able to purchase that property and then work with the, the state and federal government to be able to then put an easement on it later and then sell it to a farmer at an uh, affordable price. The deep open space program, uh, again, uh, Granby Land Trust has been very active. A number of municipalities have programs. Uh, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has matching dollars that the state has used very, very effectively. Forest landowners are our options with the Healthy Forest Reserve Program, US uh, Forest Service Forest Legacy and Community Forest Programs for protecting forest lands. And then there's also money available for restoring farmland. As we know, oftentimes beginning farmers can't afford uh, to have the best farmland, but there is money available for restoring that land. Next. And then finally, there is a lot of program assi and assistance. And I think that uh, when you look at that planning for agriculture document and the conservation options, that there's a lot of information about the programs and assistance that are available in Connecticut. Uh, we all talk and we work very well together. So I'm sure that we'll be able to with this suite of federal state agencies and nonprofits that we'll be able to find someone that can help you and get you the answers to your questions about how to grow agriculture and community or your agriculture business and to protect your farmland and forest land. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And now I'm going to turn it over to John. Uh, thank you, Kip. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit um, about uh, Kip's very last bullet on his last slide, which are some of the programs and resources available um, through municipalities um, and, and local initiatives. Um, I'm going to be presenting a little bit of a preview of um, the uh, the document that the four of us have been working on together, which is an update of the Planning for Agriculture Guide, which is uh, sort of a handbook for Connecticut municipalities. Um, and basically talking about what towns can do or really ought to be doing to be a little bit more proactive 
um, about um, protecting and promoting um, agriculture and, and uh, preserving farmland itself in towns. Um, so part of, uh, and a lot of, a lot of um, the, the, the headings you see on my slides are actually basically chapters or big sections from Planning for Agriculture when that comes out. Um, so this is again, a little bit of a preview. Um, part of un understanding agriculture in the town and Kip um, did a very good job of, of making the case. Um, and I think again, we're probably preaching to the choir on that. We all, I think have this baseline understanding that farmland is incredibly important. For a variety of reasons, um, you know, foremost among them is that they provide us food and fiber, um, but uh, they provide so much more. the The trick um, in a lot of communities when they get started is that they just don't know um, how much actual farmland resources they they have. Um, in a lot of communities, and I, I come from Northeast Connecticut, so we have a lot of uh, larger dairy farms or comparatively larger dairy farms. And everyone, you say, what kind of farms do you have in town? You can think of those prominent ones. You know where the cows are or, or you know, perhaps the alpacas or, or there's a nice orchard in town. But the resources go well beyond that. And it really behooves a town to conduct that baseline inventory um, to really get a sense of where you're at. Uh, one of the most useful ways of doing that is to actually to assign that to a group of people. Um, and so we've recommended um, over and over, over a long time, uh, of the wisdom of establishing an agriculture commission. And Granby has done that, I think, more than a decade ago, which is fantastic. You guys were probably one of the first um, agriculture commissions in the state. Um, and that is an enormous first step because it, it not only sort of assigns this task to somebody, you know, to, to sort of start this process of, of planning for agriculture for a town, um, but it also tells an important story to those agriculture producers and farm and forest land owners that the town cares and the town has made this a priority. Um, but beyond the Agriculture Commission, there are other ways that communities should be incorporating um, farming and agriculture into their local processes. So it's, you shouldn't just have you know, farmers and farm supporters on the Ag Commission and kind of segregate them over there. You should be incorporating farmers um, and, and large, large you know, forest landowners into your Planning and Zoning Commission. Farmers should be on your economic development commissions because farm, um, particularly in a place like Granby, are a very important part of the economy, of the local economy. Um, make sure that, that um, your farmland uh, outreach and efforts um, focus on not only sort of the large landowners, but also underserved populations and people who had been traditionally neglected in land use decisions. Um, and I think finally, one of the most important things that we um, suggest is that uh, you have a point person. Obviously, it's great to have an agriculture commission, but that's a group of volunteers. Um, it's the towns that have been most successful in planning for agriculture and advancing these, these um, initiatives has someone in town that is the go-to, that, that is the, this, the, the um, uh, reservoir of information, of resources, and people that have questions about starting a new farm, advancing, um, expanding a farm, can go to. You need that point person. Uh, so, Latha, if you could advance. So, some of the actual specifics. Um, and again, Grandy has done a good job. Um, I think over the last over the last decade. I think um, sort of the the last years of of Fran Armentano's um, administration as town planner and the first years of. Abby Kenyon's uh, administration as, as town planner have been very productive. Um, but in general, some of the things that we, we recommend um, is that municipalities, because as Kip said, um, local policies have actually much more effect on, on the viability of uh, local farms than sort of national trends and, and, you know, and, and then federal, federal policies. Um, and so the, towns are empowered to adopt um, favorable tax uh, treatment for agriculture itself, for farm buildings, for farm equipments. Uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, tax breaks that can be given to uh, improve the, the farmer's ability to, to financially maintain um, the agriculture as, and, and keep land open. Um, right to farm ordinances, I saw on the, on the um, Granby uh, Agriculture Commission website that they do have a link to the state um, right to farm statutes. 
Um, many towns also adopt a local one, um, which kind of echoes state right to farm and, and makes it clear that uh, you intend to be a farm from the community and, and will support your farmers against sort of these, these petty sort of um, run of the mill uh, complaints that, you know, maybe you get caught behind a tractor um, on a road for a while, or maybe you occasionally smell um, uh, manure or, or, you know, you, you, you see uh, crop fertilization and things like that, and it, it bothers you. Um, but towns recognize, towns that have adopted right to farm ordinances recognize the value of farms and, and will put their thumb on the scale on the side of agricultural users to continue these, these appropriate uses. Um, and similarly, uh, working on your, your zoning regulations to make sure that um, the whole variety of different things that can happen on a farm and in conjunction with a farm are allowed to happen without too much, um, without too much red tape, and without too much hassle. Um, the, the picture on this screen is a picture of the Jack Years farm up in uh, Northwest Connecticut in North Canaan. Um, these are huge, huge composting, um, uh, uh, basically, uh, giant hoop houses, essentially. Um, the Jack Ears is a dairy farm. They generate quite a bit of, of manure um, and they uh, have, have basically turned that manure into um, an additional business, an additional profit center um, where they mix it with leaves and, comp and mulch and things like that and, and uh, end up selling that, that compost back to landscapers and, and construction companies and things like that. And it goes all over the Northeast um, because this, this, you know, uh, the town of North Canaan, for instance, does have these agriculturally compatible business regulations. Um, and again, the, 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 um, all of these things, thinking about these things really should be somebody's job in, in each town. Uh, next one, Lava. So as a planner um, in Connecticut, we try to start with the master plan, the plan of conservation and development which is, um, it's a 10 year document, the, town, the towns are required to update this every decade. Um, and it's really intended to be um, the, the, the reservoir of the town's goals, the town's vision for what it wants to be over the next 10 years. Um, and it represents a series of policies, a series of vision statement, and coming out of that document really should be um, the actual, nuts and bolts policies um, and investments that the town is making over the next 10 years. Um, and so there is no better place to make a positive, strong statement about the value of agriculture, if that is what a town wishes to promote, than in the plan of conservation and development. Uh, next slide, please. So your own plan of conservation and development was last updated in 2016. Um, and uh, and at the very beginning, um, you have a statement of Granby's fundamental values that I've screenshotted here. And the very first thing, and good for, good for Granby, is agriculture is one of the fundamental values of, uh, of Granby and the people of Granby. And this is based on you know, community surveys and outreach and public involvement. I'm sure some of the folks on this, on this call this evening were involved in that document or in some of the community outreach efforts. Um, and I thought at first maybe this was in alphabetical order, but I threw all of the, all of the values there. Um, and agriculture was first, and that's not just because it's, it's first alphabetically. It is a primary um, value for the town of, uh, for the people of Granby, and, and that's fantastic. And so now it's the sort of the question of, we recognize the value of, of Granby, we want to, of agriculture in Granby and want to support it. So what are the actual things that can be done to move that along? And that's the goal of the next, well, at, at this point, the next six years, um, as we're a couple of years into this, into this plan. Next slide, please. Um, the specific goals under um, the, in the agricultural section of your town plan, again, 2016, is, you know, is pretty specific to preserve remaining farmland, um, you know, focus on Holcomb Farm, um, you know, encouraging new and beginning farmers. Um, again, looking at some of the things that, that Kip said about the resilience and, and effects of climate change, sustainable farming, um, looking at how local food can support the local population in terms of, in terms of food supply. Uh, and then finally, the, the thing we started talking about is actually doing that inventory um, and find out what lands are actually the best to farm. Um, and if they're not farming, perhaps you know, be a little bit more aggressive in, in making those lands uh, more proactively productive. 
And so this is what you in your, in your plan um, laid out. Next slide, please. And so it, in, in general, obviously, so Granby has um, their sort of marching orders in, 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 those, in those seven or eight um, action items. But there are uh, other ways that um, the town can, can sort of take the next steps. You've identified wanting to preserve and protect that, that farmland. There are a number of ways that that um, that can be undertaken when the when when you actually put this stuff into action. Um, if you identify uh, these local these um, locally important soils and and prime farm soils that are not currently in production, um, the town should be prioritizing those for either preservation, um, for acquisition, for agricultural purposes, um, and if and if this this land is already owned by the town, that the town should be considering working with um, the farm community to keep that land in production, whether it's just hayland or whether you have long-term lease um, for actual crop production. Um, the town and, and the land trust, for instance, I know the Granby Land Trust is very active. Um, if there are fallow lands that, that can be productive on the, on the, by virtue of the value of the soils, that land should be in production. Um, and, and there are there are ways of of moving down that road. Um, other other um, tools like infrastructure limitation. One of the things that the plan of conservation and development um, incur, uh, requires actually is to um, map out where the extent of public water and sewer lines ought to be over the next ten years. And by um, planning that very carefully, you can um, you know limit the extent of sewer lines and therefore really um, reduce the uh, availability of developable, uh, easily developable land or high density developable land and make sure that you keep um, those development pressures at relative um, uh, distance from some of your, some of your critical lands. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, transfer of development rights in a moment, which is a, it's an interesting tool for, for a town like Granby to consider. The next. One of the primary ways that uh, a town can sort of put its, its uh, thumb on the scale of how it treats agriculture and how it can um, uh, you know, affect agriculture for the positive or negative is through its zoning regulations, which are basically the rules for land use. And in an ideal world, these regulations come, um, they flow directly out of the goals and policies expressed in the plan of conservation and development. And you know, in a big picture way, identify what areas of town are, are, are suitable and encouraged for development, which areas are suitable and, and encouraged for conservation, and how that process um, should unfold. Uh, one of the primary ways, um, the, one of the primary things that a, a good set of zoning regulations should do is properly define farming and what are agricultural uses, and we encourage you to use the state's definition, which is section 1-1Q of the Connecticut General Statutes defines agriculture in a very broad and pretty inclusive way. Um, so you can, you can make sure that you're encouraging and allowing the full range of agricultural uses when you say we, you know, agriculture is an allowable use in, you know, in zone RA40 or RA20. Um, also taking a look at, at agricultural uses, um, things like agritourism, farm stores, and accessory uses, you'll see the picture of, um, uh, basically a, a, a wedding reception set up in a, in a large barn. Um, there are a lot of, you know, as Kip pointed out, the, the, the scenic nature of Granby's farms is extraordinary. And a lot of, uh, more and more of these farms are finding opportunity um, to, uh, you know, show off their farms, preserve their farms, and make some side income by diversifying the types of activity that, that um, happen on these farms. And that is only possible if the zoning regulations are set up to allow that. Um, and so it's very important when you start to look at um, these things that you, you include the full range of potential uses on a farm that again, do not take away from um, the ability to actually you know, produce food or, or crops, um, but can, can diversify a farm's economic picture. Uh, and then an another thing to take a look at, it's very contentious, particularly in, in a mixed community of, of you know, suburban lands and farmland um, where you run into um, you know, potential conflicts and questions about you know, small farms with, with livestock and backyard chickens and 
um, bees and even, you know, um, even larger, larger um, animals, llamas and goats and things like that on relatively small lots. Uh, it's very important that a town be thoughtful um, about how they regulate um, livestock. And um, I participated in uh, the production of this guide that's, that's shown in the picture that zoning regulations um, for livestock, there are best practices and it's a, it's a guide for Connecticut municipalities. And it does, it specifically looks at how to set up good, um, uh, good rules um, for livestock regulation that protect the interests of farmers and, and the community and neighbors. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bottom line it for you, is that there is no perfect number. Um, you know, it's not one cow per acre or, or three goats per acre. It really has more to do with how those livestock are managed. Where their, you know, where their shelter is placed on the parcel, how their manure is managed, how their grazing is managed, um, and it really is more about uh, best practices than it is about just sort of a, of a, you know, a Euclidean two acres per cow, you know, um, strict formula. Um, so it has some nuance, and this is why zoning regulation and the crafting of them and and the enforcement of them is so important in an agriculturally supportive community. Next, please. And again, in, in a community um, like Granby, where you have a lot of large chunks of farmland, but you have over the last you know, 15, 20, 25 years, had a lot of um, uh, residential development that, that kind of creeps into the farm and forest land and subdivisions and cul-de-sacs and things like that. Um, you know, growing population communities run into a lot of, a lot of potential conflicts between agricultural operations and, and new residential operations. Um, and again, there are there are ways of putting them into putting regulations into your subdivisions when new developments happen to make sure that you provide adequate buffers um, for for new developments from farming, uh, not only to protect the, the the farmer from incursion, but also to protect you know the, the quality of life for the new residents. Um, again, livestock management when you when you have these um, uh, conflicts when you know there are there are cows in people's backyards, there are there are goats. Um, there are chickens on on small lots, um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion to make sure that uh, it's really not a chicken's problem; it's a rooster's problem. in in, in most cases, uh, when you're dealing with when you're dealing with um, livestock regulation and 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 residential zoning. Um, but again, the most important thing is to have a well-educated staff person who is um, on top of this and can can answer the question and lead the town in in thoughtful regulation. Next. And so I think I finally, I think this is my, my last slide, just to present an, an interesting idea that we talk about in the Planning for Agriculture guide, um, and not, not knowing if, if folks are familiar with this concept, but in a community where you have a lot of land that you want to protect, and Granby has a lot of land that it has already protected and a lot of land that it really wants to protect. And um, if you recall from those 2016 Plan of Conservation and Development um, goal slides or those, those vision slides um, or items, the, the town center, Granby Center, um, and that village is extremely important to, to um, grow and be vibrant and protect. So when, you, when a community has both a lot of land it wants to protect and an area of community center that it wants to grow and encourage more development, uh, transfer of development rights is a very interesting market solution to that, where you essentially um, allow uh, an increased density in that, in that community center um, or in that area of, of development and, and commercial activity um, above what is what the current zoning would allow. So say it's currently a one acre zone in the community center, you could go to a half an acre or a quarter acre zone um, if you have development credits. And the way you get development credits is by protecting land in those outlying areas of town. In, in Granby, it would be in those areas in Western Granby and Northern Granby. Um, where farmland is um, more important and, and you, have the, you have those clusters of large farm and forest blocks. And so it creates basically a, a, an incentive for those property owners in the center to protect the um, outlying areas, the farmland, in order to see more economic um, value in the center. And the center can grow and people can um, see their, their, their property gain value at the same time as protecting um, uh, critical farmlands and forest lands. So it's 
it's a little complicated, but it's a very intriguing an idea. And, and particularly when a town such as, such as Granby has very clear ideas that it wants to protect some lands and develop and, and, and grow others, um, it could be a very interesting idea. And, and um, this is something that we talk about in the, in the Planning for Agriculture Guide. And I think that's it for me, Lafa. I can turn it over to you at this time. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I am actually going to zoom out a little bit and um, return to the question to, so why should we all care about farmland access and kind of connect it back to systems and specifically our food system and other social systems. So I really like this quote. This is actually from a study. So it's from an anonymous participant. To grow your own food gives you a sort of power and it gives you dignity. You know exactly what you're eating because you grew it. It's good, it's nourishing, and you did this for yourself, your family, and your community. So agricultural lands are essential to uh, a more resilient food system that is better prepared for crises. Farmland is vital to this nation's food security, yet it continues to be paved over, fragmented, or converted to poorly planned residential commercial and industrial uses. Uh, and just to reiterate a, a statistic that um, Chelsea mentioned earlier from the Farms Under Threat report, between 2001 and 2016 alone, 11 million acres of the nation's irreplaceable agricultural land was lost or fragmented. That's equal to all the land in the U.S. used to produce fruits, vegetables, and nuts in 2017. Roughly 4.4 million of these acres were nationally significant. That is, it's our best land for food and crop production. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, millions of Americans have seen empty grocery shelves for the first time in their lives. We have come to realize how critically important farmers are to us. So, you know, those of us who don't already know that, um, how we turn to them in crises and how they innovate to meet demand. But they can't do their job and we won't have sufficient healthy food without farmland. Each state, and in the case of New England, region needs to secure a critical mass of high quality farmland to ensure that its food system is resilient in the face of extreme disruptions. After all, what is more essential to human life and society than healthy um, food? We need agriculture, especially environmentally sound agriculture to survive. As a nation, it will take regionally diverse and sometimes redundant systems to support the increasingly complex public demands on agriculture. All states must act to protect farmland. So this is just to reiterate what the previous speakers had described about farmland, especially on the local level um, and policies to support protection um, and why that connects to, you know, perhaps urban areas where I, for example, where I am in New Haven, um, you know, why, why someone um, would care in New Haven about farmland elsewhere in Connecticut, but also urban farmland. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that. Um, now I'm going to look at farmland access, or rather farmland dispossession through a lens of equity, justice, and historical oppression. So in 1910, one in seven farmers were African American and held titles to approximately 16 to 19 million acres of farmland. And as you see from the graph, over the next century, 98% of black farmers were dispossessed through discriminatory practices at the USDA and various federal farm programs. These farmers were often denied loans and credit, lacked access to legal defense against fraud, and experienced outright acts of violence and intimidation resulting in a 90% loss of Black-owned farmland in the U.S. Access to land has been named the number one barrier for farmers of color to advance their work, to feed the community, and for Indigenous people to maintain their culture and sovereignty. White landowners currently control about 95 to 98% of the farmland in the U.S. and nearly 100% in the Northeast. This, as I've already described, is not an accident of history. The food system is built on the stolen land of indigenous people and the forced labor and forced displacement of black and brown people from ancestral territories. 
It's therefore no surprise that today's farmers from socially disadvantaged groups, uh, which are African American, Latinx, Native American, women, immigrants, LGBTQ+, um, they face an immense list of barriers, including structural socioeconomic inequalities and a history of discrimination in credit markets, state and federal farm programs, and real estate. Many of these farmers, especially Latinx and Hispanic farm workers and indigenous peoples, possess valuable agroecological knowledge at risk of being lost without opportunities to put it into practice and pass it on. Another important point, um, mitigating climate change in the agricultural sector requires encouraging new farmers, incentivizing wide-scale adoption of environmentally sound agriculture, and also rectifying historical disparities to land access and tenure. Sound policies can provide an enabling environment that supports new farmers access to farmland by coordinated efforts at the federal state and as we emphasized in our presentations at the local levels. These policies must eradicate the historical discrimination and agency practices against socially disadvantaged farmers and encourage farmland acquisition by resident operators. So, you know, rather than absentee um, landlords or landowners, you'd, you'd want people to own it, um, to own land um, where they live. Um, so, no worries, you can do something as some of the other presenters have already described about um, kind of advocating for local policy. Um, for example, I wanted to just uh, talk about a few things happening in the Northeast right now. So there is a groundswell of efforts toward land reparations and rematriation of land. The Native Land Conservancy is reclaiming territory for the Wampanoag through cultural respect agreements. The Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is preparing to hold lands collectively for dozens of Black, Indigenous, and people of color farmers across the region. And I'll be using the abbreviation BIPOC for um, uh, that, for Black people, Indigenous people, and other people of color. Um, many are also building on the legacy of um, other organizations like the New Communities Land Trust, Freedom Farms, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, and other BIPOC-led land stewardship projects to re-envision land ownership in the region. The power and responsibility lies with many of us to rectify the harm committed by historical and continued systemic oppression, especially with predominantly white institutions that have benefited from appropriated wealth. So on this slide, I have some strategies that you could start with to overcome these injustices. Um, you can prioritize trainings, um, especially those that delve into the aspects of how and um, how we all uphold and perpetuate white supremacy, both historically and today. Um, attending anti-racism trainings is only the first step though on this path and they can provide a foundation for continued work in anti-racist practices. You can also make it easier for BIPOC to rent, finance, and own land by creating grants, subsidies, and other incentives, including mechanisms of land ownership, transitions, and land reparations to return stolen land. Um, you can support alternative land rental and ownership options, such as ground leases, lease to buy options, cooperatives, agricultural conservation easements, cultural respect easements, as I mentioned, and cultural use agreements. Ex you can expand financial support for BIPOC via grant programs and identify barriers to participation for existing grant programs. You can support BIPOC participation in fair, sustainable markets uh, via direct marketing, farm to institution procurement arrangements, food hubs, and market diversification. Um, you can provide targeted infrastructure investments, uh, especially for BIPOC-led farm and community improvements, such as packing, storage, processing, kitchen improvements, internet access, and affordable housing for farm workers. And um, lastly, but not least, you can include BIPOC in decision-making. This is really important. You, it would be really great to include BIPOC in grant panels, advisory boards, and committees. They should also be fairly compensated for their time and contributions. 
And it's something that, you know, is even easier that you could start right here in Granby. Um, and John mentioned this a bit in his presentation is to find out, has your town done an assessment of how agricultural policies relate to local and probably in the um, case of Granby, regional, regional populations of BIPOC? Um, once that assessment um, is done or, or in preparation for the assessment, you can work with planning and community development professionals in town to develop an understanding of the, these demographics locally and regionally, um, particularly among BIPOC communities. And then you can work with representatives of these BIPOC groups to document needs for access to and ownership of farmland, farm capital, and farm products. And finally, the impacts of COVID-19 have been especially hard felt by small-scale farmers and BIPOC farmers. By providing additional capacity to local farmers and amplifying the benefits of their locally grown produce, these efforts may lead to a post-pandemic food system that is locally grown, more equitable, more resilient to future disasters, and better for farmers, consumers, and nature. Um, so I'll end right there. I just wanted to give you kind of an idea of viewing farmland access through equity and justice and thinking about systems and how, you know, talking about farmland access connects to food security and food systems, both locally, but also regionally, when we think about the six New England states. And I will hand it back to Chelsea right now. Thank you, Lathos. So that is the end of our presentation. And I just wanted to end by saying that um, my information is on the slide here. And I'm sure that if you wanted to contact Lathar or John or Kip, they would also share their um, information with you all, maybe in the chat. And if you want to learn more about our Farms Under Threat Report or the Planning for Agriculture and Conservation Options Report, they will all or Farms Under Threat is currently available on the Farmland Information Center website and planning for agriculture and conservation options uh, will be available hopefully in the next couple weeks. So stay tuned and thank you so much again for hosting us and I'll turn it back to Anne. Or Anne or Holly. <laughs> and. Um, it's okay, um, but I really wanted to thank you all. There was a lot of information in there. I was taking notes as I was going along, and then I finally said, okay, this is we, we definitely a good thing we recorded this in case we need to refer to it again. Um, I don't know if everyone saw that um, uh, there were some comments in chat. Um, I think Chelsea got a, um, a, a good link up there, the, the um, Farms Under Threat New England Report. So I'll make sure we can get that information out to the attendees. Anyone who's registered for the program and sent an email, I can follow up with those uh, that information. Um, I was also um, listening to your your comments about that the, that guide, the um, agricultural planning guide. When is that coming out, or when is when is that available? Soon. Soon. <laughs> Soon. <laughs> okay, so um, that's exciting. Okay, that we'll be able to um, to have access to that. Um, let's see. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Because if they do, we've got a few more minutes um, with our panel, and you're welcome to unmute and um, ask away. I know Anne Anne may have some some things to share. Um, I know she follows this, this, these topics very carefully. So, um, actually, I, I do. If I can jump right in. <laughs> um, so, one of the, I wonder if we could just discuss a little bit. Um, one, I'd like to direct everybody if you haven't read um, the Food Vision for New England from, uh, what's that, Farm, oh, what is it called now? <laughs> Farm Solutions, or I can't remember. Solutions New England. Yes. Yeah. Food Solutions uh, New England, yep. Food so yes, thank you. Food Solutions New England, that's a really valuable and well done report. Um, but I think, so jumping off from that, I think the beyond just preserving the agricultural lands we currently have, 
That report outlines the need to bring more agricultural land into production. And so I think identifying the valuable soils we have in town and um, like at, at our own property on Wilhelm Farm, uh, good soils that are not, um, not being put to their maximum value right now. And that's part of the work we're trying to do. But I think as a community, things that we should be thinking about. I don't know if um, Lathar or Kip or any of the other speakers on want to address sure. that. Yeah, no, I, I think that right. I think that's a, it's an excellent publication that it provides a um, kind of a vision. So if New England were to supply 50% of our food, what would that look like? And to do that in a way, obviously we would need to eat differently. And though we think that it could be done and though their additional land would need to be brought into production in a sustainable way and we could still protect critical, you know, large uh, core forests and important natural resource and habitat areas as well. It certainly can be done. And so part of it is that uh, not only from that perspective, but also of thinking more broadly about what a diverse agriculture looks like in food system, of to think about like Ann is doing on her property of, of how can you, you know, still be able to have valuable forest products, but at the same time, clear enough land and be able to grow forage for livestock, particularly small ruminants like like goats and sheep, or uh, making opportunities for somebody to, because you, you have some parts of town that even in climate change may be able to support uh, maple sugaring operations of leasing land for people to do a maple sugaring operation or to harvest um, wood products for mushrooms or to plant um, ginseng and golden seal and other high value crops. So we need to think as as broadly and diversely as possible about what is agriculture. We all have our biases about what we think agriculture is and also you know particularly as uh, with Lathaw's job of what does agriculture look like in in urban and suburban communities and what are the values that'll have some of the same values but it also has other values as well. So particularly, how does that look in your community? So thanks for pointing out that report, Anne. That's a really good uh, big picture thing to for people to read. I, I guess that the two things that I would offer, one is again, and I'm glad Lathaw talked about that, about the farmland access issue. And I put in the chat there about that and Certainly, there are you know landowners that of farmland and forest men that may not realize that there are people out there that want to farm in Connecticut. They may be doing it differently, have a really different idea about a farm business. But through Connecticut FarmLink, we have a list of over 300 people right now, without even advertising very, very hard, that want to purchase or lease farmland in Connecticut to expand a business or to start a new business. So there are people out there that, that want to do that. So you could certainly list your property or if you want to talk more about that, we can certainly do that. And then the other thing is if you do look at that farms under threat, uh, because these are large national data sets that were used, it has a little bit of trouble with the complexity complexity of our land use patterns and of our agriculture, the average size of a field in Connecticut is five to seven acres. The average field in the Midwest is 640 acres. And it's you know pretty easy to tell whether it's corn and soybeans or hay, while the satellite has a little trouble figuring out whether it's uh, a playing field or whether it's a hay field or what it is. So if you, if you drill down too far, in that database, you'll say, hey, that's not right, or something's missing, it's because of that. Doesn't mean that it's wrong, it's just me, you may be going beyond the scale of precision, but overall, I think it shows a picture of, it does much better about picking up what was developed than necessarily what may be the, what currently is in agriculture. So you'll see a few things that may not appear quite right, but overall, I think on a, on a 
a, a multi-town level and a state level, it really does a good job of capturing the conversion and what our most important lands are. And that's the other thing is too, is specifically uh, some of the biggest threats and the biggest conversions in Connecticut have been in the Connecticut Valley, the Connecticut lowlands, which is its own unique ecoregion and has some of the highest concentrations of prime farmland and nationally significant farmland in the Northeast. And unfortunately, it's also easily developed because it's flat and well-drained. Um, on that note, I, I have a question. Um, my name is Allie, um, and I have a question for the panel. First of all, thank you. This is a wonderful, been wonderful presentations. So thank you. Um, I recently learned about um, 830G and, um, and or the Anwar bill, which um, from what I understand as it was presented to me by uh, the Greenwich Planning and Zoning um, would remove um, agency from local planning and zoning um, to the state um, as the desegregate Connecticut, uh, Connecticut movement um, begins to take momentum. And it was presented that this would threat agricultural land as well. And I was just wondering if that's in fact true, that these bills could potentially. Uh, that's, that's, I would say an exaggeration. Okay, um, that's good to know. That's what I was hoping to hear. Cause I, I yeah, yeah, okay. Um, it, it focuses, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of moving parts there. I mean, there, there's, we're gonna, we can get, this actually could be another whole session for the, for the public library. Uh, but A30G is the Affordable Housing Appeals Act, uh, and that's been on the books for uh, over 30 years, um, which where it requires um, municipalities who do not have currently 10% of their housing stock considered to be affordable. Um, it sort of flips the, flips the administrative burden on applicants who are proposing to do a housing development that contains some affordable housing. Um, that's been on the books for, for years and years and years. Um, and I, you know, Granby's seen probably very few uh, actual appeals, um, and that largely because of uh, market. Um, the the places that get a lot of affordable housing appeals are those that are hot real estate markets, which is to say Fairfield County, um, and maybe some places, you know, in 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 West Hartford, Avon, that that have not only um, hot housing markets but also the infrastructure to support them, which is to say sewer lines and water lines. Um, so. The, the quieter a community is, the farther it is from job centers and the less infrastructure it has, um, the, 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 the threat of these affordable housing appeals gets less and less. That's step one. Step two is um, Senator Anwar's bill and the desegregate agenda. Um, I think are very important steps forward um, for those communities who have been most um, obstinate and resistant uh, to being inclusive. And Connecticut is one of the most segregated um, states in the country uh, when it comes to racial and economic uh, segregation of our communities. Um, large lot zoning in, uh, in, in wealthy communities that have infrastructure to support them is um, sort of the, and areas of high opportunity um, is really the target of um, the desegregate agenda. So areas where you're on the Metro North train line where you have good transit and a lot of uh, um, employers, but uh, communities that are not able to access those employment opportunities. Desegregate will look to increase housing opportunities um, more heavily in those places. But there are some sweeping things um, that it does propose. And again, these are, these are legislative proposals. It would do things like allow accessory apartments, sort of an in-law apartment um, or, a, or a, an apartment above your garage as of right, where you wouldn't have to go and get a variance or a special permit. It would ease some of those restrictions that a lot of um, very very conservative communities have traditionally had. Um, but the, the majority of it, again, would affect those communities that are high opportunity, transit-oriented areas, you know, Metro North, the Hartford Rail Line, um, the Hartford New Britain Busway Line, where you've got a combination of um, density, job opportunities, transit, and um, a pronounced lack of, a lack of housing diversity. That was an excellent question, um, Ali. Thanks for asking it. And John, that was a very thorough answer. Um, does anybody else have a question for our panel? I mean, 
they're they're so knowledgeable. <laughs> we have them here with us tonight, so I'm 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 act I'm just hoping that um, there may be another question or two out there. And if not, I'm going to put somebody on the spot. Um, hopefully, maybe she's listening. Um, Paula, um, Paula, you probably got a little bit of background with some of the planning um, that goes on with the town. I wondered if if we had anybody actually um, that's joining us tonight that can talk a little bit about, um, I was really interested in those developmental rights or those credits that John had talked about earlier in the program. I was wondering if anybody knew if Granby had a program like that in place or even has, has talked about those types of things. <laughs> I suppose I, sh I should know, having just retired as the chair of planning and zoning. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Um, I would think that our ag, ag commission would be the place to go because if something like that is needed um, and interested, uh, something that certainly sounds fascinating, that they would look into that and then come in and look at how our regulations would, would impact that. Um, I think the one thing that we've had recently is the problem of neighborhoods and uh, incompatibility, that they think the incompatibility with farms that, that need to diversify in order to survive. Um, that's why we're going to be looking at our regs to make sure that um, everything is very clear and consistent and we, our farms do have the opportunity to um, flourish. I think it's very important. But that's really right now, I think one of the things that has come up is um, neighbors giving farmers a hard time when they're 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 doing what they need to do and it's it's by right and it's been approved and there's not a problem, but hassling a little bit. So I don't know how you change that. Um, they moved there because there was a farm. <laughs> it, of the farm. So. Paula, that that reminds me of a a situation in a neighboring town several years ago where um, there was a, I think a dog kennel that had been there forever and ever and ever. Yep. And a developer built um, a bunch of really nice new homes on a, a lots next door. And then as soon as everyone bought their homes, they called to complain to get the dog kennel shut down mm -hmm. because the dogs were barking. Yep. So it's, you know, it's, um, it's always, uh, there's always, issues I guess that that have to be addressed but um. you're right and the first the first meeting of planning and zoning and I think Clyde is watching and he will remember we had a development at the end of Harmony Hill and that area had been and was a working farm area and manure the smell of manure in Granby was great so on the mylar the final thing it said this is a farming community or active farm, and there will be no be manure spread in the spring. So anybody who bought a house in that subdivision knew right away that that's mm -hmm. the beauty that was going to happen then, and there was never a problem. Mm -hmm. So it always has been a, a bit of an issue, and you hope people appreciate what they have and to be a little more tolerant. Well, it probably goes back to, and maybe Latha talked a little bit about this, but not only for uh, people of color being kind of shut out of the farming market, but um, people not of color being so distant from how their food is grown and not understanding the whole process. Um, it, it, you know, we just move, have moved farther and farther away of understanding um, that the carrot actually comes out of the ground and it looks a little bit dirty when it comes out. It doesn't come all like packaged in those nifty little containers at the grocery stores. Um, so anyway, um, that's well, Holly, this is Putt Brown. Um, oh, I've just had my uh, cataract operation today, so I'm not going to have a picture of myself. <laughs> but, but the other thing that people should know is that the Granby Land Trust has been very active in the conservation area uh, um, arena, especially with respect to agricultural land. Um, they have both raised money to facilitate the state's acquiring um, conservation easements on, for instance, the former um, Forest Davis farm, which now is an active tobacco farm. And it's the, the, those two buildings at the intersection of 189 and Wells Road have been recently um, uh, 
built. And uh, also the, the uh, Clark, Clark uh, Farm on Bushy Hill Road, which um, is uh, an, an, an active orchard that was, was uh, made possible, the acquisition of that was made possible by a conservation easement, um, which the Granby Land Trust essentially negotiated and facilitated um, the Granby Land Trust has been extraordinarily active in supporting the um, Holcomb Farm and uh, in due course, you know, maybe we'll try to work with the town fathers to formally protect the, Hol the Holcomb Farm. It's, it's, it isn't protected for agricultural use right now, which is a shame, but that's, you know, perhaps in a future agenda. Uh, the, the, the Granby Land Trust also negotiated on behalf of the state and made possible the protection of the 525-acre Worthen Farm in West Granby to be added to the um, um, Ender State Forest. And uh, the, the Granby Land Trust also has um, helped uh, uh, the, the, the McLean Game Refuge in various ways. Um, acquire land that could be put into uh, um, agricultural use, but right now most of that land is viewed as habitat for um, bird life and other wildlife that, that uh, need uh, an early vegetation environment, um, which is so rare and, 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 and the rarity of it is leading to the disappearance of a lot of native species that used to live in transitional forest. But, but in any event, there, there, there is a lot going on with the Granby Land Trust. Um, the, the, the real, and, and, and we've, we've acquired uh, 100 plus acres from the Pelkas um, that is primarily agricultural land recently. Uh, and I think the real dilemma in Granby is not so much that we don't have land available for agricultural use. The real problem is that we don't have viable farms that can use that land. There are a lot of little the sort of mom and pop operations or the Holcomb Farm, but there, there, there aren't a lot of young farmers that, that want to make a business of, of um, farming in Granby. And I think that's the real dilemma for us. We probably have some land on, in, at, at the Granby Land Trust and, and also at the McLean Game Refuge that could be available if there were the right tenant. But of course, the right tenant needs the, the, the wherewithal to be able to buy the, the machinery and the the, the the farm improvements and the like. So that's in a way a greater dilemma in Granby than the availability of the land itself in, in, in my view. Anne may have a comment, but I'll just uh, say as I, as I said before that there are people that do want to farm. So part of it may be, um, you know, certainly I, welcome to put pro list properties or talk with landowners about listing properties on Connecticut farm link. We could certainly talk more about a strategy for outreach and for uh, reviewing proposals. The other challenge can be if there isn't affordable housing. And then the other thing is if there are farm properties that don't have any infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the most diversified agricultural operations that we're seeing new and beginning farmers, they need to have some buildings, uh, they need to have a well, they need to have fencing. So that would be something, you know, again, and uh, I appreciate the work that the Granby Land Trust has done. I had actually worked with you on protecting uh, Bushy Hill is um, to allow, make sure that in any easement language that it allows for farm structures, perhaps a uh, housing uh, envelope with uh, limited square footage, so you don't get a, you know, it, it having it turn into an estate. So certainly there are folks that would be willing to work with you if you think that there's land that's available 
um, for for farmers and, and for that, people that want to farm. Yeah, my maybe. my only comment is that it's it's one thing to say that you need a building envelope for a house, but you also need to be able to uh, finance the, the the building of the house and the buying of the equipment and that sort of thing. Uh, that's right. And, so and, if it, and, so, they typically would either need a long term, very long term lease. Or there are creative mechanisms of uh, ground ground leases, and then um, being able to, you know, finance the the buildings and own the buildings separately. And so there are some unique kind of methods that people are using to make land and farm structures and homes more affordable. It, and it's difficult for the Granby Land Trust to get to much into that because we're a land preservation organization and I, I don't think that we want to become you know, landlords and or, or those who would facilitate the, 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 the capital needs of young farmers. So anyway, it, it, it's a real dilemma in Granby, I think. Uh, I wish that there were that there were more people that really had a house to live in and a barn to keep the tractor in and the like that really wanted to make something of uh, a farming life here. The town of Granby, for instance, owns the former Avanchin farm um, that is leased to um, a, a Massachusetts farmer. Um, and, you know, b b by all rights, th that would be a local farmer. Uh, there's quite a lot of land, but the problem is the town has a very substantial investment in the property. Um, they, they purchased it with bond financing, and uh, and you know, there, there's no good answer yet that has come before the board of selectmen to use well, that. Yeah. Well, if it doesn't have an easement on it, you could sell an easement to the state of Connecticut. And then it would be at an affordable price where it could be sold to a private farmer. So again, I'm certainly willing to make connections with you to talk about other opportunities. Well, that, that's not a Granby Land Trust property, but it is a property that has been um, the, the, the subject of a couple of mm. failed uh, agricultural true. development ideas that, that haven't for, for a variety of reasons haven't gone anywhere. But I, I think that, that, that if somebody were able to come before the town with an economically viable solution that would essentially bail out the town and, and assure the, the, the town of a long-term agricultural tenant, that would be something that might possibly get more traction than the earlier proposal staff. Anyway, I just, at the end of this session, I thought that I'd mention the, the dilemma that, that um, finding farmers for the scattered agric agricultural lands that we have in town um, we, is, is a dilemma, I think. So, given, the, given, given the fact that we don't have any any buildings to go along with the agricultural land. And, but that's a really, it's a really good point. And um, I don't know if anybody in our group tonight represents any of our local VOAG schools or agri-science centers, um, but I did reach out um, to Northwest Region 7 High School and then Suffield because they both have agri-science centers. Because I was curious to, to know if there were young people and students in the area that actually pursue those concentrations with their studies and then go on to to follow up with that um, as actual farmers or to somehow support that field. So if anybody in the group wants to raise their hand and say, yes, I'm a young person or and I this is an area of study that I've followed and we'd love to hear from you to hear about those challenges um, or, or what it's like. Um, 
I don't see anybody jumping up, so maybe not. Um, maybe no one's um, with us tonight. Um, but I think, Pat, I thank I think you very Anne, much. Anne had some a, a comment. Okay. Um, well, just to respond to, to Pat, I think that a really big issue is having affordable housing so that as farmers do come onto the land, there's certainly plenty of people that are really interested, but it's housing is a real difficulty. And um, I wish the land trust could look more into um, these ground leases. For example, the Pelka property, personally, I thought it was a shame that that house got torn down because um, a young farmer would have put in a lot of sweat equity to bring that house back to a more livable state. And certainly Ann Pelka was living in it. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to respond to that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ann. That's a Go ahead. <laughs> a big thank you to the panel. This was a fabulous presentation to bring to the community. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Yeah, we we um, all, I think there's there's been a few comments in the chats and whatnot, and we're all very grateful that you folks put together your time and effort and shared a good part of your Wednesday evening with us tonight. So I, I want to, on behalf of Granby Public Library, the Granby Ag Commission, Granby Land Trust, I know, um, I just want to say thank you to um, Kip, John, Chelsea, and Latha. You guys really went above and beyond. Um, and uh, if anybody has any questions or feedback, they can reach out to me or they can, we'll get more information, ways to contact um, the group that was here tonight. If you folks feel strongly that you'd like this group to come back and talk more specifically about certain topics, um, we can certainly arrange for that also. Um, and uh, I wish you all well and uh, look forward to seeing you at, at another uh, Granby Library program. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank Keep up you. the good work, Granby. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.